what's going on and let your voice be heard. Um, tonight, don't forget about service at 6 p.m. Again, we will be having a youth service over in the next building, but uh, Brother Tim will be preaching over here this morning, or excuse me, tonight. And uh, if you don't come to Sunday night services, you need to consider starting. God is really doing things in our, well, in our Sunday morning and Sunday night services. But let me tell you something. Last Sunday night, we had some miracles take place in this house. We really did. There was a young lady who was completely blind in her right eye, and God gave her her sight back Sunday night. Not only that, we prayed for Sister Terry Cox. I think she's up in the children's church this morning, but she wasn't even here. We had somebody stand in for her, and, and um, she was waiting on some test results. They had, I won't go into all the details, but the doctors thought that she had cancer and, and was really sure that she did have cancer. I, I spoke with Brother Scott last week on Tuesday, and he said that the doctor had to call down to the lab twice because he was so sure that she had cancer, but the test results came back no cancer. Amen? Come on, that's the God we serve. Not only that, my wife, she had been, she had been having some, some issues with her heart beating really fast, and, and she had to wear a heart monitor, and, and we were waiting on test results for that as well. Well, she went in Wednesday, and there's nothing wrong with her ticker. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, I, and I'm just going to tell this too, Brother Doug, he, he came up and prayed with us in the altars. That was the first time that he had been in, since the accident. And the only way I can describe that is, has anybody ever been out watering their garden or something and, and you've got the water hose pinched off and, and then you let it go and there's just a sudden flood and rush of, of water coming? That's what we experienced last night with, or last week with Brother Doug when he came back into this pulpit. I'm, I'm telling you. You don't want to miss any service. You never know what's going to happen in a service. I would hate to miss out on what God is doing. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we just love you and we thank you for what you have already done in this house, God. And I praise you in advance for what you're about to do, God. I just pray that you would anoint your servant that I could preach this message exactly how you've laid it on my heart, God. And I pray that you would anoint the minds of this congregation, that they can receive everything that you have in store for them. Devil, I bind any, any plot, any agenda that you have for this morning. We rebuke you in the name of Jesus, and we tell you you're not welcome in this house. Father, I just pray that we would be able to just flow with you and receive everything that you have in store for us. In Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody in the house said, Amen. Now, I want to give you... Some, um, some Bible this morning, okay? I, I want to preach a message called Line in the Sand. And I'm going to read you some, some scriptures here. And, and God is speaking to the children of Israel. And he's giving them instructions of what they need to do when they get into the promised land. I'm going to read out of Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. It says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons to take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your children away from following me. And they will serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars. Smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the people on the face of the earth to be His people, His treasured possession. 
Now here God gives the children, of, uh, the children of Israel instruction on what they are to do when they get to the promised land. Now this is the place that God had in store for them, but it was still inhabited by the enemy. God was going to go before them and be with them through this entire process, and all they had to do was obey His voice. Now if we skip ahead to Joshua chapter 24... God is giving the children of Israel a history lesson, reminding them of how their forefathers had served other gods. He, he says that after the flood, he chose Abraham and multiplied his seed through Isaac. They found themselves in slavery, so God sent Moses and Aaron to deliver them through a series of plagues. God drowned the Egyptians in the Red Sea, but they got stubborn, and what should have taken an 11-day journey through the wilderness took them 40 years. God mentions several places here that they had gone and how he had delivered several enemies into their hands. And then we pick up in Joshua chapter 24, verses 13 through 15. He said, So I gave you a land on which you didn't toil, and cities you did not build. And you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Fear now... Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors' worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Then he goes on to say, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors that they served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So in other words, God was telling them to choose this day who you will serve. In other words, he was saying, pick a side. He was saying, I'm drawing a line in the sand, and you're going to have to choose which side you're going to be on. And in that moment, they unanimously agreed to be on the side of the Lord. And they all served the Lord as long as Joshua and his elders lived. The book of Joshua ends on a high note, and then we move over to the book of Judges. Now, do you remember what God told his people in Deuteronomy? He said that when they go into the land to completely destroy everyone and everything. Now, he didn't do this because he is a merciless God. No, he told them that because he knew that if these pagan people were allowed to dwell in the same place that they were, that eventually they would be tempted to worship their gods. So the Israelites came to the promised land in Canaan, and they began driving the enemy out of the land. And remember, God told them to completely destroy them. But we see in Judges 1 and 21, it says, the Benjamites. Now, the, the, the Benjamites were a, one of the tribes of Israel. It says, the Benjamites, however, did not drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the Jebusites lived there with the Benjamites. Go on to verse 27. But Manasseh, who was also another tribe, did not drive out the people of Beth Shan or Tanakh or Dor or Ibleam or Megiddo and their surrounding settlements, for the Canaanites were determined to live in that land. Verse 29 says, Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer, but the Canaanites continued to live there among them. Verse 30 says, Neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites living in Kitron or Nehalal. So these Canaanites lived among them, but Zebulon did subject them to forced labor. Verse 31, Nor did Asher drive out those living in Echo or Sidon or Alab or Iskab or Helba or Apek or Rehob. Now y'all stick with me. I know this is a lot of information, but I'm going somewhere. Verse 33, neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh or Beth Anath, but the Naphtalites too lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land, and those living in Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath became forced laborers for them. Verse 34 says, the Amorites confined the Danites to the hill country, not allowing them to come down into the plain. And finally, verse 35 says, and the Amorites 
were determined also to hold out in Mount Harez, Ajalon, and Shelbim. But when the power of the tribes of Joseph increased, they too were pressed into forced labor. Now, why did I read all this? Because instead of utterly destroying the enemy like God told them, they allowed them to live in the same place that they lived. So what happened? Let's go to Joshua chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. It says, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? And I have also said, I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you, and their gods will become snares to you. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud. They repented. And they called that place Bochim, and they offered sacrifices to the Lord. So God sent an angel of the Lord to rebuke them. They wept, they offered sacrifices, and they served God for just a little while. But in Judges chapter 2, 11 through 13, it says, Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook Him and served Baal and the Asherah. As a response to this, in Judges 2, 14 and 15, it says, In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. And they were in great distress. Now, just a few chapters ago, they had all committed to serving God. But at this point, they had completely forsook the God who they said that they would serve. What happened? How could a group of people that had fully committed their lives to God, that had seen so many miracles, that had seen the hand of God firsthand, that had witnessed things that we can't even imagine witnessing by the hands of God, how could a group of people like that fall so far when they had seen so much? It's because they didn't drive out the people and the things that God told them to drive out. You see, when they committed themselves to God, I believe that they really did mean it. I believe that they really had a good heart and really were, were, were trying to serve the Lord. But because they allowed the enemy to dwell in the same place that they dwelled in, they went and worshipped their other gods. Now, what does that mean? The worship their, of their gods back then, uh, to Baal and Asherah, they appealed heavily to fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. The acts of worship were sexual acts of worship that enticed the Israelites to take part of these abominations. But check this out. Had they gotten rid of them like they knew they should have, they would have never fallen into the mess that they fell into in the first place. They would have never forsook our God, the one true God, Big G, and served their gods, little g. You know what I'm saying? So, as a result of this sin, God gave them over to be slaves and a pattern set in. They would sin. God would give them over to slavery for several years. Then they'd cry out to God and God would deliver them. Then they'd fall again. God again would give them into slavery. They would cry out to God again and God would deliver them again. If you read the book of Judges, it happens over and over and over. And here's my point. There were generations of people that were born into bondage in this time all because the generation that went before them compromised and didn't do what God told them to do. 
They thought, well, it's not that big of a deal. We'll, we'll, we'll let a few of them live and, and we'll put them to work. We'll make them slaves. We'll, 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 uh, we'll charge them money and all that stuff. That's not what God told them to do, though. God told them to utterly destroy them, but they thought it was no big deal. They'll just let them, you know, we won't serve their gods. They can do their thing over there, and, and we won't bother them with our thing over here. And they thought everything was okay, but it wasn't. At one time, these people drew a line in the sand, and they said, we'll never cross this line. We'll serve God all the days of our lives. But they stayed too close to that line, and they were sucked back in. Now, why am I saying all of this this morning? Let the youth pastor preach the rest of this message, okay? Allow me to show you some things. Now, I want you to remember that there were entire generations born that were born into bondage because the generation that went before them compromised. I'm going to give you some statistics. For those of you who've heard me preach lately, you, you found out I like statistics. According to the Pew Research Center, only 15% of Generation Z, now Generation Z are the people on the face of the planet right now in our nation that are from the ages of 4 to 24. I know we have quite a few represented in here, Generation Z. According to the Pew Research Center, 15% of Generation Z, only 15% feel that same-sex marriage is a bad thing. Only 15% think that's a bad thing. Only 12% of Generation Z think that living together before marriage is a bad thing. 59% of Generation Z think there should be more than two gender options when you fill out a form. You know, when you're checking all the information off and you check whether you're male or female, 59% of Generation Z think there should be a third option. I don't know what that third option is, but they believe there should be a third option. The average age of exposure to pornography is 10 years old. Let that sink in for a moment. 10 years old. 64% of young people aged 13 to 24 view pornography at least once a week. According to the University of Columbia, the average age for a teenage boy to consume alcohol for the first time is 11. The average age for a, a, a female is 13. In 2012, 72% of students had consumed alcohol by the end of high school. 30% of, 37% of those had consumed alcohol by the end of the 8th grade. According to the CDC, each day in the United States, 2,000 youth under the age of 18 try cigarettes for the first time. 2,000 of our youth. 300 of those will become addicted and have to use them every day. These statistics deal with our children. And while we may not specifically condone these things, what do we allow into our lives that condone these things for our kids? How in the world can we expect our young people to have a proper view of marriage when we condone shows like The Bachelor? Oh, y'all may want to stop clip, clapping for just a moment. Let me say that one more time. How in the world can our, our young people have a proper view of marriage when we condone shows like The Bachelor? When, when it's okay for a woman to do all kinds of things to, to win the affections of a man, including go on a fantasy overnight date in a fantasy suite. How in the world can we expect our, our young people to have a, a proper view of sexuality when we have shows like Modern Family that glamorizes same-sex marriage as just the normal thing? Of course our kids are going to be confused when we allow these things to come into our house. The big hot topic debate of today is LGBT curriculum being taught in the schools. Now, when I was doing research on this, it seems like they keep adding letters to this. It was LGBT, then LGBTQ, and I was reading, and it said LGBTQIA. I don't even know what that stands for. I don't think we need LGBT curriculum. I think we need G-O-D curriculum in the school. Can, can we get an amen for that? But for most of us, this LGBT curriculum taught in schools really fires, fires us up, right? 
We don't want this thing be taught in schools, but why in the world should it bother us so much if we're teaching our kids the same thing in our households? How can we expect our young people to not drink, not smoke, and not cuss if that's what they see and hear us doing? How can we expect our young people to not have sex before marriage when the majority of the top ten songs in the nation deal with sexual things? I've said it before and I'll say it again and I'll say it to the day I die. Parents, be aware of what your children are listening to. You owe it to them to check their phones, their iPods, if they have that, CDs, whatever they have. Check it. Know what your children are listening to. Most of them listen to this stuff because it's what their parents listen to. Come on, can I, can I touch a vein this morning? We're not talking about students that are off in New York and, and other places like this. No, I, I, I talked with some students Wednesday night. And got personal with them and, and, and asked them what their struggles were currently. And, and, and the three things that was most prevalent among them was pornography, vulgar music, and vulgar movies. That's not the kids up north, that's the kids in our area. And I'm telling you, most of them struggle with this because it's what's allowed in their households. Music is a very influential thing. If you don't think it is, I can prove it. Elijah, I, gave the, I preached along these same lines Wednesday night, and, and, and I gave this example as well. Elijah, our son, he's, he, he'll be three on September 7th, coming up. Man, it doesn't seem like it's, it don't seem like he should be that old, but he's potty training, doing a great job. I get, I get FaceTime all the time telling me that he pee-peed in the potty, and I'm so excited. I turn into a blubbering idiot when, I, when he tells me that, and I just make all the faces and Y'all know what I'm talking about. But there's these movies that, that, that have been released to help these toddlers out, like Elmo's Potty Time. Anybody ever seen Elmo's Potty Time before? I've watched it ever since Libby was young, and it hasn't failed us yet. But as these toddlers watch Elmo, and, 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 and as he learns to go to the potty and, and sing songs about going to the potty, guess what Elijah is going to want to do? He's going to want to go to the potty, right? So if it's effective for our younger kids, our toddlers, what makes you think that our teenagers won't be affected when they listen to all kinds of lyrics that are of a sexual nature? If our teenagers listen to songs about going to the club, guess what they're going to want to do? They're going to want to go to the club. If they listen to songs about riding around in the back roads with a cold one in one hand and a dip in their lip, guess what they're going to want to do? Just that. Music is a very influential thing. But let me tell you something. If they listen to songs about worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, if they'll listen to songs that encourage them to worship God, if they listen to those types of things, guess what they're going to want to do? They're going to worship the one true and holy God. Amen? What am I saying this morning? I'm saying that we must draw a line in the sand today. We must choose this day whom we are going to serve. And I tell you this morning, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Amen? Isaiah 59 and 19, the last part of this verse. It says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Now, I'd say that right now in our day and age, the enemy has come in like a flood. And so we have to lift up a standard in our lives. And that standard, that line in the sand that we have to draw is holiness. Holiness, people of God. Whatever happened to that word where we actually made an, an effort to live right and to do right and whenever God convicted us of something, we would do our very best to give those things up. It doesn't matter what it is. We have a whole generation coming up that's believing all kinds of things and it's because they have seen it modeled in our lives. Anytime that a major flood is coming... 
people will put sandbags around their house. They'll stack the sandbags in a line so that the flood will not come up and that barrier will ensure that their entire house is saved. People of God, it's time that we build a barrier around our homes, around our families, around our businesses, around our schools to ensure that the enemy cannot come in and sweep away our families. It's time that we rise up the standard of holiness in our nation once again. Come on, give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. There are 327.2 million people in the United States. That's a lot of people. 372 million, excuse me, 327.2 million. 75% of those people identify with the Christian faith. They say they're Christian. So according to that, if my math is correct, 245.4 million people identify themselves as, as Christians in our nation. Let me tell you something. If 245.4 million people would raise up the standard against the enemy, he wouldn't stand a chance. If 245.4 million people would stop watching and listening to filth, then Hollywood would get the picture. If 245.4 million people would take a stand against Budweiser and the big tobacco companies, then our children would not fall into those addictions. But it has to start with us drawing a line in the sand. It starts with us saying that no matter what, we will not cross this line. No matter what comes our way, no matter what new fad, new temptation, we will not cross this line. And it starts with us drawing that line in our families this day. Hallelujah. I don't know if y'all feeling it like I'm feeling it. I asked God to let me feel a little piece of his heart this morning. Actually, I'll tell you exactly what I prayed. I said, God, let me feel how you feel about this. He said, I can't do that because your heart can't take it. I said, God, just give me a piece of it then so I can preach this effectively. Men, the Bible says that we are the priests of our household. In other words, we allow what comes in to our household. If it's there, it's because of us. I don't care if your wife wears the pants of the family. The Bible says that you are the priest of the household and the buck stops with you. So in other words, the devil can't come in unless we allow him in. If we have drawn the line in the sand and we have built up the standard of holiness and put the sandbags out spiritually, the devil cannot come in to our house. Let me illustrate it this morning. Let's say for, for just illustration's purposes that we're all one big family and this is our house right here. Look at your neighbor and say, hey fam. Yeah, that was awkward, wasn't it? <laughs> but all you guys are family and there has been a, a line drawn in the sand and I'm the devil, okay? I'm the devil. Y'all hang with me for just a moment. You see, there's nothing I can do to come into your house because there has been a line drawn in the sand. There has been a barrier built up. But let me show you something. Tony Thomas, come let me in, please, sir. Tony, don't leave me hanging over here now. Come on, Tony, hurry up. Come on, time's a-wasting. Thank you, sir. You may sit down. You see what just happened there? Tony... Papa Tony, the priest of the household, he opened the door. And I, me being the devil, was allowed to come in. Even though there had been a barrier that had been built. You may not want to go out there. The devil's in there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You're good. <laughs> but even though a line had been drawn in the sand and a barrier had been built up, the priest of the household, I'm not done with that door being open yet. 
the priest of the household opened up the door. And now, as you can see, the enemy is allowed to come in like a flood and sweep the entire household away. How does the enemy come in? He comes in through our TVs. He comes through our, our cell phones. He comes through any manner that he can. And, and anything that sin that we allow into our household is the enemy coming in. And you better watch out because he'll come in and sweep away your entire family. Maybe he's sweeping away like a flood. Well, let me tell you what you have to do this morning. Shut the door. You have to shut the door. Tell him to get out and shut the door. That's all we have to do. And stop that flood. Stop that madness from coming into your house. This morning, we have to draw a line in the sand. Give me some piano, brother. We have to draw a line in the sand this morning. going to keep this down here. Draw the line in the sand. You got to use your foot. Draw the line in the sand. Choose which side you're going to be on. You see what the problem is. A lot of you are like the Israelites. There was a time in your life when you drew the line in the sand and you told God you would serve him but you didn't take the enemy out of your life. You allowed him and things to dwell in your house. And now your entire household is suffering because of that. Some of you, you drew the line in the sand. But you stayed too close to the line. Which allows you to just go back and forth at your convenience. Oh, it's Sunday. I'll come over here on this side and lift my hands in worship. But, oh, Monday's coming. Let's go back over here. Let's, have, let's, let's do some things. Let's drink some beer. Let's, let's have a little bit of fun. And Sunday will come back and we go back on the other side. Let me tell you something. When you draw that line in the sand and Jesus is on this side and the enemy is on that side, then you need to get as far away from that line as you possibly can. Because you see, the further you get away from that line, the closer you get to Jesus. And the closer you get to Jesus, that's when your family starts getting saved. That's when your needs start getting met. That's when miracles start to happen. That's when we begin to see change in our schools, in our communities, in our neighborhoods. That's when change starts. But it's not going to start until we get away from that line and get closer to Jesus. Well, I don't want to get close to Jesus because I don't want to have to give up those things in my life. Well, that's okay. Don't, don't be satisfied with never having a need met then. Be satisfied with the sickness in your body. Be satisfied with your, with your children running around and doing all kinds of crazy things. Well, we may, we may lose our social status. People might look at us funny when we, when we stop going to these events and we stop watching these movies and, and things like that. People might look at us a little bit funny. Well, let me ask you, whose opinion matters more to you, the opinion of God or the opinion of man? I'm at the point in my life I don't care. If God convicts me of it, I'm giving it up in a heartbeat. There are things in my life that I really enjoy doing, not necessarily sinful things, but God's convicted me of them. Guess what? I don't do them. Is it, is it popular? No, especially not with my children. I'm not going to get into details, but there are things that we don't do in my house that, that, that go on in other households that aren't necessarily sinful. But God has convicted me of it. It's not the popular thing to do. It's tough at times. But I want to get closer to Jesus. I've been praying about some things that I haven't seen come to pass yet. And I know that if I can just get close enough to Him and, and far enough away from the enemy over there, that I'll start seeing those things come to pass. Is this making sense this morning? You may be the person that's sitting on these chairs. And you may say, Pastor Nathan, I blew it. I did draw a line in the sand. But because I went back and forth so many times, anybody ever took their finger and, and drew something in the sand and then you kind of spread it over and it went away? You've crossed over the line so many times that that line isn't even there anymore and it's blurred for your family. So they don't know where you stand. 
They don't know which side of the line you're on. It's not too late. You may say, well, I've really messed up. I've done some things that I don't even know that I can get forgiven from. Well, let me tell you, this Bible right here is chock full of people that didn't have it all together, that had really messed up. Man, you think you've messed up? Start reading the Old Testament and the New Testament. You'll find, you'll find some people that were really out there. and God used them. Jesus took, he didn't take the best of the best. He didn't take the people that had it all together. He took the people that had issues, that were messed up. And he took them and he made them fishers of men. It doesn't matter where you're at this morning. It doesn't matter how blurred that line is. It's not too late to redraw that line. Oh, but my family won't understand. Guess what? When I got saved, I didn't really have a, I had my wife. I didn't have any kids. But you know what? I was so nervous. Got saved at the greeting card factory at 3.30 in the morning on a Wednesday. And I was nervous about going home and telling Dawn because you got to understand, we didn't always live like this. I was nervous, didn't know what if she was going to say when I told her the decision that I'd made. And, and I went home and I said, honey, i got to talk to you. I gave my heart to the Lord last night and I didn't know if she was going to leave me or if she was going to punch me in the nose. I didn't know what she was going to do. But she looked at me and she said, I've been praying for this. I've been waiting on you to make the first move. Husbands, wives, I don't care if you've messed up. I don't care how far out there you are. Jesus hasn't given up on you. And he's standing this morning with arms stretched wide. The prodigal son, he had really blown it. Won't get into the full story, but he was wanting to go back and just be a servant in his father's house. We didn't feel worthy to be called a son anymore. Oh, but as he began to make his way back, his father saw him from afar. And he didn't see eyes of condemnation. He didn't see a cold shoulder. No, the father ran to the son, embraced him, said, kill the fatted calf, my son is home. It's not the Father's will to condemn you. It's not the Father's will to shun you or give you the cold shoulder. But this morning I'm asking you to draw the line in the sand. Yes, it's going to be tough. Yes, there will be sacrifices that you have to make. But I'm telling you, this life is so much greater on this side of the line than it ever was on this side of the line. Well, I may have to stop drinking. Well, I've got to tell you what, you get you a good dose of the Holy Spirit. It's so much better than any drug or alcohol I ever put in my body. Amen? I'm telling you, give Jesus a try today. Everybody stand to your feet.